I coded my own ray tracer for Minecraft. Now, despite running on the CPU and being written in JavaScript, it can produce an image in only a few seconds. But it hasn't always been this fast, and getting it to this point wasn't easy. In my last video I talked about how I made this and how ray tracing works in general. But this time we're diving a little deeper to improve its performance. Rewinding back, during development all I had to work with was low resolution, noisy, and broken images. Eventually I was able to get it working properly and I decided to really stress test it and render a slightly higher quality image. Measuring in at 640 by 480 pixels, with 32 samples per pixel, my unoptimized ray tracer was able to render it in one hour. Which is crazy because it's not even that big of an image really. But after putting some work into optimizing the code, I've gotten that time down to 14.3 seconds. For those counting, that's over 200 times faster. And so the clickbait is in fact justified. I mean, the exact numbers change depending on things like the resolution, samples, CPU specs, and of course the phase of the moon. So your results may vary, but for this test image and this configuration, I was able to speed it up by a factor of 200. And even though it's not anywhere close to being real time, I think it's pretty cool. So what do you think I did? Switch to a different language? Use the GPU? Nope. With any JavaScript project, you can usually make things faster by reorganizing how data is organized and manipulated. I started by looking at this bit of code that takes in two vectors and adds them together. It's a simple little function used all the time in the code, and yet it has a problem which makes it a lot slower than it needs to be. We're asking the computer to first make a new object, then to add the numbers up and store the result in the new object. Creating an object in JavaScript is slow. I mean, it's not that slow, but compared to adding some floats together, it is. And if we're doing it a lot, it adds up. This alternative way of doing it works out to be a lot faster. In this case, we're adding the values of one vector to the other, which works because JavaScript passes objects by reference, but it's a bit of a double-edged sword. It modifies the original object, which in most cases is fine, and kind of what I was doing anyway, but in some cases I needed to do a little bit of extra work to make sure that it wasn't contaminating something it shouldn't be. There are also some other helper functions that could use the same treatment. It's pretty much just more of the same, changing it so objects are only created when it's really necessary. Another thing that was pretty big was switching to using typed array buffers. They let you store data in a similar way to JavaScript's regular arrays, but are limited to a specific data type, such as 32-bit floats or 8-bit integers. These are stored in a buffer, which needs to use a contiguous region of memory. This limitation is actually very useful as far as the compiler is concerned. If we know the position in memory of the start of the array, and the size of each element, we can look up the information stored at each index of the array using simple arithmetic which means manipulating this data is a lot easier. But sometimes we need to look up information another way, such as the case of when a ray collides with a block. We start with the block's ID, and we need to get its corresponding material information. The material isn't just a number, it's an object with properties corresponding to its albedo, emission, and roughness. Each of these are their own buffer that get bundled together. For this use case, JavaScript provides us with objects that can store key value pairs. In practice, this means taking the ID, which we could say is the same as its name, and using it to look up the material. The object associates each specific block name with its material. But if we really want to get the best bang for our buck, then you can't overlook the map. Unlike our plain object, the key to a map can be of any type. Whether a string or an integer, it doesn't care. This lets us look up the material simply with a number, and it tends to work faster. Next, let's turn our attention to the blockat function. 
This function is provided by the MindFlayer library, and its purpose is simple. Take a position vector, and it gives back the block at that position in the world. Given that this is done once for every step for every ray, a conservative estimate would put this at tens of millions of times for our little test image. So it's really important to make sure this operation is as fast as possible. I think the best solution is to call block out on every position in a given area ahead of time, and store the data we need in a way that allows us to look it up again quickly. Which will initially take some time to do, but it'll make it a lot faster any time we want to render an image. Here's how it works. We start with a map. These handy JavaScript objects allow us to map from a key to a value. But a position vector is an object, which won't work as a key just out of the box. Its individual parts could each be a key on their own, but we need the whole thing. My workaround is to combine the x and z axis of the position into a single value using bitwise operations. Then use that to look up a buffer which contains the block types for a vertical column, which can be indexed using the y value. This code might look a little weird, but it's quite simple when you break it down. It's using bitwise operations to operate on the individual bits that make up the numbers. I'm taking the bits from the end of each axis and putting them together to make an index. This means technically the world of the ray tracer is a repeating grid. But as long as this size is bigger than the render distance, you won't actually see it repeating in the images. Then this operation I'm doing on the y value might look pointless, but it's actually a way of rounding numbers. Which works because bitwise operations in JavaScript convert to a 32-bit integer. By the way, I call my approach a block field, and testing the difference between the two, my approach comes out to be 57% faster. But keep in mind that looking up the block type is only a portion of the time that goes into rendering an image. Even so, this would translate to a pretty sizable speed improvement overall. It's definitely better, but I'm not entirely satisfied with it, so if you can think of a better way of doing it, then please leave a comment. Doing these checks faster is important. But if we took bigger steps, we could potentially reduce the number of checks we need to do in the first place. The idea of a distance field is that for any location, it stores the distance to the nearest solid block. This effectively gives us a safe zone where the ray tracer can take a step in any direction without hitting anything. To make a distance field, I'm using a lot of the same code from the block field with a couple of key differences. First, instead of storing the type of block at a position, I'm simply storing whether or not it's filled in. As I mentioned last time, this can be done by checking if the block is either air or cave air. But something I didn't know, and was pointed out to me by this comment on my last video, is that Minecraft has a third type of air called void air, which also needs to be accounted for. After that, we need to loop through all the blocks that are empty and figure out the distance to the nearest solid block. From what I've tested, the distance field seems to more than double the speed of the ray tracer. But there's a problem. It causes these weird artifacts in the image. I think the issue stems from the ray traversal part of the code. A ray can use the distance field to take bigger steps when it's further away from blocks. But if it's close to a block, it switches to using a different algorithm which takes smaller steps. I suspect the issue is switching between the two algorithms, but I just can't prove it yet. And well, I can't exactly use the distance field when it's broken. But it does have potential, so I'll keep working on it. Implementing a new way to get blocks also lets me add multi-threading, which MindFlayer isn't really built for. It's a pretty widely used way of speeding up a program. You have a CPU, the main processor in a computer, which can do calculations. It has multiple cores that are each able to do operations separately from each other which allows it to smoothly run multiple pieces of code simultaneously. Multi-threading is when you write code to be split up onto the various threads. It's not always straightforward, and sometimes people make projects too convoluted by introducing multi-threading way too early in development. Which is why it was one of the last things I did for this project. Waiting until most of what I had was fairly mature and was unlikely to change too much. So, how powerful is this so-called multi-threading anyway? Well, it depends. On my laptop, the available parallelism is 12. 
having more threads than this won't really help. In reality, someone might be running other stuff too, like Minecraft or the operating system. So it's a good idea to set the number of threads to a bit lower. Or better yet, make it adjustable. I haven't done that, but it is a good idea. So I'll do it right now. Okay, I've rendered the same image using different amounts of threads, and the results are pretty interesting. With one thread, the image takes about three minutes to render. With two threads, it decreases to under two minutes. As the number of threads increases, the time it takes goes down. Until we get to 12 threads, which as I mentioned is the amount of available parallelism on my specific computer. Meaning that if we increase the number of threads further, it shouldn't... I don't know why this is happening. One of life's great mysteries, I suppose. That's really about it. My last video sort of exploded in a way that I wasn't expecting. And as a result, I recently reached 4,000 subscribers. I haven't prepared anything to celebrate with, but I appreciate everyone that watches and comments on these videos. Speaking of which, last time I got a few comments suggesting ways to improve the speed, and a lot of these are different from the ones I came up with. So it seems there's still a lot of room for improvement. I know choosing JavaScript for this project was a bit of a strange choice, but it somehow worked out fine so far, and it's been fun seeing how far I can push its performance. I hope this has been interesting, I've definitely got more to explore here. Thanks for watching.